federal regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Even a little bit more casual than usual because I forgot to take off my yard work hat before I uh, left the house and headed down to the studio today. But I am glad that you've joined me on the program. We're going to be talking about uh, the latest anti-gun shenanigans in California here in just a moment or two. But uh, first, just a, a brief note. You know, the news broke uh, Tuesday afternoon that the National Rifle Association's annual meeting not going to be held, uh, canceled because of COVID concerns. It was supposed to take place next week in Houston, Texas. We were going to be there covering that for you. Uh, and I've seen a lot of reaction on both sides of the gun control debate, by the way. Uh, you've got folks on the left, gun control supporters, who you would think would at least say, all right, you know, NRA, don't, don't like what you do when it comes to the Second Amendment, but uh, good on you for, uh, you know, playing it safe. No, not at all. No way. All right, good riddance, all right. Meanwhile, you've got uh, some folks on the Second Amendment side saying, all right, well, what's what's really going on here? Was, was the NRA, uh, do they have the, not have the money to do this? Like, I don't know. I don't know what the financial situation is, but I guarantee you that the NRA is going to lose more money not holding the annual meeting than they would have had the meeting actually taken place. Uh, I suspect that COVID actually was the driving factor here. Um, although I will say that I wish that there had been greater transparency on the part of both the organization and some of the major exhibitors who it appears had pulled out uh, of the annual meeting. As a matter of fact, I was working on a story yesterday afternoon about that very fact when the news broke that the annual meeting had been canceled. So I do think that COVID was the driving factor here. Harris County, Texas is seeing its case count explode. They had something like 8,000 cases reported on Sunday. Uh, one hospital system has closed three standalone emergency rooms. Another hospital system says they've got a, a wait for beds for both COVID and non-COVID patients. So the, the COVID threat is real. Uh, you've got, you know, a sizable number of NRA members who are going to be older Americans who may very well have chosen not to get the vaccine, uh, may very well be resistant to wearing a mask. And I, I, I had one of the questions that I'd actually asked the NRA was, okay, well, what sort of COVID mitigation strategies are going to be in place? Are you going to have mask requirements? Are you going to require vaccination? Not that I expected that the NRA would say, yes, we're going to require vaccination. But, um, I think that there was the potential for a number of members to actually leave Houston uh, with COVID, and uh, it could have impacted them uh, severely. So, uh, you know, I, I that that's where I stand on this. Uh, was it the right thing to do? Yeah, I think so. Um, just based on what I've seen from the COVID counts, I was planning on going and covering the interannual meeting. I'm fully vaccinated. Uh, in fact, my wife just got her booster. She is, you know, immune compromised, stage four cancer patient. So uh, we do play it safe when it comes to her health. But I felt like if she had the booster, I'm fully vaccinated. I could go. I could cover the annual meeting would be OK. I probably would have worn a mask the entire time, uh, even though I'm not convinced that masks are all that effective. I would have taken, you know, every little step that I could have taken to uh, to make sure that I tried to keep her safe uh, from contracting COVID. But uh, anyway, Hopefully, the NRA annual meeting uh, will take place next year in Louisville, Kentucky. In the meantime, we do have the Second Amendment Foundation's Gun Rights Policy Conference, which is going to be held online uh, coming up at the end of September. We'll be talking more about that in the days and weeks ahead. But right now, let's turn our attention to uh, today's big story, and that would be the effort in Los Angeles to go after, quote unquote, ghost guns. Yes, the L.A. City Council is going to consider a ban on uh, untraceable ghost guns today considering a motion that would ban the possession and sale of homemade ghost guns we've got to call got to call them ghost guns as often as possible to really scare people to drive home the fact that people should be scared of these things the motion introduced by council members paul caress and paul krikorian earlier this month would prohibit the quote possession purchase sale receipt and transportation of non-serialized unfinished frames and unfinished receivers as well as non-serialized firearms in the city of los angeles uh, if approved on Wednesday, the L.A. City Attorney will be asked to draft an ordinance that the City Council will then vote on again to make the ban a law. Uh, Koretsky Korean note that the kits usually cost between $400 and $525, come in cardboard boxes. God, cardboard boxes? That's so bad for the environment. That contain uh, steel barrels and other parts, and quote, because the parts are not finished guns, they mostly escape California's gun control laws, which is not exactly the case, but we'll get to that in a moment. According to the motion, last month, Los Angeles Police Chief Michael Moore so that ghost guns now account for one third of all weapons recovered by the LAPD. OK, so do, quote unquote, ghost guns escape California law? No, not really, because uh, the state of California does ban 
the uh, possession of unserialized firearms. You're supposed to, even if you build your own, you're supposed to serialize them. Now, are criminals paying attention to that law? No. Any more than they'd pay attention to a ban on quote-unquote ghost guns coming from L.A. Any more than they pay attention to the uh, requirement that you can only carry a firearm if you have a concealed handgun permit. Any more than they pay attention to the 10-day waiting period uh, or any of the other California gun control laws on the books, right? As a matter of fact, the, the very fact that Los Angeles is considering this local ordinance, which, by the way, I think is Los Angeles can't put a felony offense on the book. So they would create a misdemeanor offense of possessing a, quote unquote, ghost gun. I mean, we're not even prosecuting misdemeanors in California anymore, are we? For the most part, we're really not. So I'm not even sure what this would do other than allow anti-gun council members like uh, uh, Paul Koretz and Paul Kerkorian to pat themselves on the back and say, look what we've done. We've done something as opposed to doing something that works. But here's the thing. The fact that L.A. is trying to put this ghost gun ban on the books tells me that California's background check law for ammunition purchases does jack squat to prevent violent crime. Because if that gun control law worked, And right now in California, the law is, before you can buy a single round of ammunition in the state of California, you have to go undergo a background check. You have to get a little card that says, uh, I've been approved to purchase ammunition. And you're not allowed as a California resident to drive over into Arizona, drive up north into Oregon, purchase ammunition, and then bring it back into the state of California. That's a crime. Now, that law is being challenged in federal court. As a matter of fact, Judge Roger Benitez has uh, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs here, but this case is still winding its way through the court system, has not yet gone up to the Supreme Court. Uh, The law is still in effect, even after uh, uh, Judge Benitez's ruling, uh, because he stayed his decision. But again, if that law did a damn thing to stop criminals, then why would you need to ban, quote-unquote, ghost guns? Because it wouldn't matter if criminals could... Uh, uh, illegally acquire and illegally assemble a firearm that they're not legally allowed to own, which is the case, by the way, when a prohibited person purchases a uh, you know DIY gun kit. As soon as they build that gun, they're breaking the law because they're not allowed to possess it, right? But if California's ammo background check law was even slightly effective, this wouldn't be an issue. Because you could have criminals building all the guns that they wanted. They wouldn't be able to get a hold of ammunition. They'd be building a paperweight. And yet, clearly, that's not the case. Clearly, despite the fact that uh, California's uh, ammo background check law has been on the books for two years, violent crime is skyrocketing in the state of California. Which suggests to me that California's gun control laws don't work. And guess what? This new ordinance, which I'm sure is going to be approved by the L.A. City Council, it's not going to work either. Criminals aren't going to pay any attention to this. Law-abiding gunners are the, only going to, are the ones that will only be impacted. Uh, well, that and, again, the anti-gun politicians who get to claim that they're doing something about the rising shooting and homicide rate there in Los Angeles. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day. Our recidivist report will start there with a case out of New Jersey. Ocean County, where a teenager has been sentenced to juvenile probation for a shooting in Seaside Park, New Jersey. That's right. Yeah, New Jersey, home to all of these restrictive gun control laws, right? And yet, when you've got an 18-year-old who's convicted of shooting somebody, what happens? A judge says, come here. Come here. Hold out your hand. Don't do that again. Because if you do that again, next time there might be actual consequences here. Now get out of this courtroom. Ocean County Prosecutor uh, Bradley Billheimer announcing this week that 18-year-old Michael Jedniziak of Seaside Park, New Jersey, sentenced by the Honorable Kamari Raheel to a four-year suspended sentence to the custody of the Juvenile Justice Commission as a result of a previously entered guilty plea to armed robbery and possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose. In lieu of incarceration at a facility operated by the Juvenile Justice Commission, as requested by the state, Judge Raheel imposed a term of 18 months probation under the supervision of the Juvenile Intensive Supervision Program. As a condition of his probation, he must attend and successfully complete a 
residential program operated by the Juvenile Justice Commission. Upon successful completion of that probation, he will remain on probation for an additional 18 months and be supervised by the Ocean County Probation Department. whoop de doo I mean, I, 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 honestly, this is ridiculous. I'll give some credit to the prosecutor there for saying, well, he really should do some time behind bars. Um, but again, what's the point? What's the point of having these restrictive gun control laws in New Jersey if somebody who commits an armed robbery gets a slap on the wrist and is given probation, and yet if you, a legal gun owner in New Jersey, are caught with a 20-round magazine when you're only allowed 10, do you think they're going to give you a slap on the wrist? You think? What about if, if you, as a legal gun owner, as a Second Amendment advocate, get caught carrying a firearm in New Jersey without a license that the average citizen can't obtain? No violent crime, just you as a Second Amendment supporter carrying a gun when you're not supposed to. You think you're going to get away with probation? I don't think you're going to get away with probation. New Jersey's gun laws, New Jersey's laws are so screwed up that law-abiding citizens from other states who accidentally travel into the state of New Jersey with a firearm that they lawfully possess routinely face years behind bars for that crime of bringing a legally owned gun across state lines. What other right, by the way, disappears when you cross the boundary of a state? Your first right, First Amendment rights disappear? Your Fourth Amendment rights disappear? Nope. But your Second Amendment rights can. And again, legal gun owners are facing years in prison for inadvertently bringing a firearm into the Garden State. Meanwhile, you've got 18-year-old chuckleheads committing armed robberies who are getting away with probation. Today's armed citizen story from South Carolina. Family uh, requesting the surveillance video not be released after a man was shot and killed during a road rage incident. And uh, according to authorities, Travis Antonio Draper uh, was uh, shot and killed in a shooting that had been has been ruled as uh, self-defense. WYFF reports that the family of Travis Draper, as well as a Spartanburg City Council member, uh, Monier Abushift, got to see the surveillance video. And the sheriff's office says that uh, Abushift agreed that the other driver was justified in the shooting said that he should have notified law enforcement earlier of his involvement in the shooting. Uh, Sheriff Chuck Wright there in Spartanburg, South Carolina, says he's working with Representative Travis Moore on legislation that would require people to report to law enforcement if they have been involved in a shooting within a, quote, reasonable amount of time. Uh, Travis Draper was found dead August the 5th in his car on Highway 295. And last Friday, the sheriff outlined the events that led to his death, saying that just after 6 o'clock in the morning, Draper was on his way to work. He had stopped at a red light. It was then that Draper and another driver had a verbal altercation about that driver being too close to Draper's vehicle. The sheriff says that the men continued driving down the highway. Verbal altercation continues as they're driving. The sheriff said that both men began to increase their speed and drive aggressively while passing one another's vehicles along the road. Uh, surveillance video shows Draper chasing the other vehicle through an intersection and almost hitting an uninvolved vehicle. Draper then pulls alongside the other driver and points a gun at him. Wright says, the uh, sheriff says, that the other driver then pulled his gun and fired one shot at Draper, hitting him under the armpit. Draper died at the scene. The other driver then left the area and went to work. Sheriff says that the other driver told his wife what had happened. She later realized while watching the news that her husband may have been involved in the case. That's when the couple reached out to an attorney, and the attorney reached out to the sheriff's office. Um, yeah, you know, I got to say, I, I, I don't know if we need a law for this, but uh, it's always a good idea. When you are involved in a situation like this, yeah, you do need to let authorities know what's going on. Um, otherwise, again, it may very well come back and, and bite you in the rear if you don't. Uh, thankfully, in this case, again, there was surveillance video showing that this other driver was acting in self-defense. But what if that surveillance video didn't exist? Now, all of a sudden, you've got the possibility of being accused of leaving the scene of a crime, uh, acting suspiciously when you were justified in defending your life. I, and I can tell you, regardless of how justified a shooting might be, there will be a police investigation. Uh, you are going to be talking to authorities. You are going to have to hire an attorney. I mean, that, that, that's a given. So trying to avoid that, I don't think ever, uh, well, rarely does it end well. In this particular case, again, the uh, driver acting in self-defense, not facing other charges, uh, but the sheriff, again, went on to say that he wished the driver would have called law enforcement after 
discharging his weapon, despite the fact that uh, the evidence quote clearly shows that Mr. Draper uh, was the aggressor in this situation. And finally today, our good deed of the day. This is a school resource officer, uh, Sean Duval, a deputy in Hernando County, Florida, who is being credited with saving the life of a student who was choking in the cafeteria of a charter school. Uh, Deputy Duvall is the school resource officer at the Challenger K-8 School of Science and Mathematics. And uh, he was on duty monitoring the cafeteria during a lunch period when he observed a staff member at one of the tables trying to uh, help out a five-year-old kindergartner who was choking. So Deputy Duvall rushed to the table, saw that the student, again, couldn't breathe, performed the Heimlich maneuver, able to successfully dislodge whatever food was uh, obstructing the student's airway. student was taken to a local uh, to the school clinic. He was evaluated, going to be just fine, expected to make a full recovery. He was picked up by a parent, got the afternoon off. Uh, meanwhile, Deputy Sean Duvall went back to work. No early uh, recess for uh, Deputy Sean Duvall, but in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. We thank you, sir, for your very good deed. And we thank you for being a part of this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. As always, we really do appreciate your support. Thank you so much for watching and for hopefully spreading the word as well. We will be back tomorrow with more of the latest Second Amendment news and information. But until then, don't forget to check out BearingArms.com uh, throughout the day and night for more news that you need to know about when it comes to your right to keep and bear arms. And if you like what you see, you can always become a VIP subscriber. All you have to do, go to bearingarms.com, slash subscribe, use the promo code GUNS, you'll get 25% off of your VIP membership. That in turn will give you exclusive analysis, commentary, stories you won't find anywhere else, just as a token of our appreciation, because we really do appreciate it. Uh, Thank you again for being a part of the program. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.